tonight for this uh, book launch. First of all, I'd like to thank Shem Stuffy for making the place available, and uh, I'm delighted to get such a such a big crowd here. Uh, I'd also like to thank Eamon McNally for agreeing to launch it, and for Anthony for coming for coming to Dublin to launch it. So I I just hand you over to Anthony and he'll just tell you a bit about his book and about his career. It's nearly 30 years since I first came to Westport to meet uh, the then chairman of the Historical Society, Jarlett Duffy, because the Society had agreed to publish my first book, a biography on Major John McBride. And Jarlett invited me down for a weekend. I thought I was coming to Westport to have an enjoyable weekend, but Jarlett had other ideas. And what he was doing was editing the book. So he'd go through the book line by line, and he'd stop and say, what's your reference for that? What's your reference for this? What's your reference for the other? And unfortunately, I had neglected to keep my references <laughs> in line. So after the weekend in Westport, I had to go back to Dublin and spend two to three weeks in the National Library and other reference places redoing the references. So it was a lesson, a hard lesson that I learned. Court verdict on the divorce case between Maud Gaughan and himself in 1906. And while I call it the divorce case, uh, there was no divorce given, there was just a, a separation. And uh, the men I refer to in the book are on the cover. Uh, there's the French man, Lucien Milova, with whom she had, Maud, had two children. There's uh, W.B. Yeats, who was knew her for many years and had proposed to her uh, many, many times. But as she said herself, she never saw him as a as a, as a husband in any shape or form. And there's Major John McBride, whom she married. And the most important man in her life, according to the book, is Sean McBride. Uh, because Sean McBride lived a long life like his mother and was a major achiever in Irish nationalism. Uh, in fact, he had great influence on Maud because there were other men in Maud's life. I, I was glad to put Sean in, on the cover there as one of Maud's men in case people thought it was a, a less than salubrious book. You know, it's a very serious book. And Sean, putting Sean on the cover identifies that. But there were other men that she worked with. I name one of them in particular, Arthur Griffith. She had worked for years with him and Griffith, like everybody else who met her, fancied her but he wasn't in her league at all <laughs> but out of loyalty to Griffith and loyalty to her own career she was for the treaty, she was pro-treaty when it was signed but the effect that Sean had on her she changed sides on the treaty, she became anti-treaty and as you know then, lived a very uh, important life. There's just one other point I want to mention before I'll hand over to Leamy. Um, I also want to thank Aidan, Aidan Clark and the committee for organising this today and thank you all for coming very much. I also want to mention two chapters in the book which you, you may not have spotted. There's one chapter on the repatriation of W.B. Yeats in 1948. The person who had most influence in that and affected it really was Sean McBride, acting on behalf of his mother, Maud Gone. And I regret to say that the other chapter is entitled The Non-Repatriation of James Joyce in 1949. And the person who had the major decision there was Sean McBride. When it came to Cabinet, Sean McBride was Minister for External Affairs and he did not approve of it. And a file in the Taoiseach John A. Costello's uh, notes says no action to be taken. I'll hand you over to Leany McAnally.
thanks very much, Anthony. I start with the Falcha as well, and I don't know. I see Carmel here from the Rolling Sun. It would it be Fela Green Rolta? I don't know what it is, Osquelga. So if we've any Gael goers, the Rolling Sun Festival, Osquelga at the head. So it'd be something like that anyway. So and Falcha could she and shop and shop the bookshop and shop fresh. And I have apologies from Mary McBride Walsh, and I have to say it. But her beloved husband is here. So we have to acknowledge him. So she's away, unfortunately. I just want to... I know she'd love to be here. I know she would. I know she would. Now, Anthony Jordan, firstly, there's a glaring omission on the cover of the book. That's your own picture. <laughs> because you have done more for Maud Gone, I'd say, than any man. Especially for this generation. You've kept, you've kept her alive. And I want to say we're all grateful. We're all grateful for that because her legacy is very much alive to us because of you and a few people like you. So well done for that. Thank you. And this is book, I think, is it book? You say, I know it's 14, 15, 16 maybe? 15. 15. Book number 15 and at least six of them on MacBride, Mod Gone, the MacBrides, let's call them. So fair play. And you keep that torch burning very brightly. Regardless of the revisionists, and I say that, regardless of the revisionists, and they're out there. And your imprint, Westport Books, has the unique distinction of publishing scholarly works on Irish history that are also part of our local heritage. So for that too, we thank you for all that. On to the book, Mod Gone's Men. Some might say you are being kind by only putting four on the cover, but anyway, <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> Her father, Thomas Gunn, we'll start, we'll start with Th Thomas Gunn, he's in the book. Her father, her father was a British Army colonel and he bought his way into the army. You could buy a commission and uh, he worked as in, in the army in Cork, England, India, Cora and probably other places as well. He married Edith Cook, Cook, a lady called Edith Cook, another wealthy woman. And she died after giving birth. And the baby died a few months afterwards. And before that, there were two children. Kathleen and Maud. Maud, the eldest, born in 1866. And then they moved to Paris for a little while, living with her aunt Maud and her sister. And Thomas, the father, died in 1886. So Maud was just, just under 20, just coming up to 20. And then she discovered, a few months after Thomas died, that there was a half-sister. And that was Eileen Wilson. And it's that line, Eileen Wilson's line, that Mary McBride comes from as well. So Mary McBride, like Paul Durkin, the poet, she's connected on both sides, to the Gone line and to the McBride line. Because Eileen went on to marry Joseph McBride. That's the story on that one. Uh, and Maud said her father taught her two things. Number one, never be afraid. And will was a force that could achieve anything. Of course, it's always easy when you were left a good legacy. And he left her a good legacy, I'd say that. Now, her lover, Louis de Mille, the Frenchman, Milvois, uh, father of two of her children, uh, George and Isolt. And the little boy, George, died after 18 months. And it really, really broke Maud's heart. And to her dying day, she kept his little woolen booties in her handbag. She had them all her life. She adored that little lad. And... Um, for most of us here in Westport, we might remember in 2016, St. Patrick's Drama Group did a production, MacBride, written by Kieran Maxivna. And Patrick O'Reilly was Milvan. He was absolutely brilliant. He gave us this kind of glimpse of this funny, gregarious, generous and high-octane Frenchman who stole Maud's heart. He was a politically astute man, a politician and a journalist. And he was a supporter of General Boulanger, if I have that. You'll correct me now on that one, Brona. You're good on the French pronunciations, I'm not. Uh, he was described as an aggressive nationalist. And of course, Maud was back in Paris again. Paris, I won't say it was her second home. It was actually home from home for Maud gone. And then we all know about Yeats and Maud. And thanks to Maud not succumbing to Yeats in so many ways, we have the best love poetry ever written onto the psyche of the Irish nation. You know, it's a, it was a high price for Yeats, but not for the rest of us, because we've really enjoyed all the poetry. And then on to Major John. Maud was in, in love with Irish freedom and Irish nationalism. And Major John, he fitted both bills. So against a lot of advice, they got married, they lived in Paris, had one child and separated. And I'm glad that Anthony has 
up here the text of the divorce judgment and to say that it actually wasn't a divorce, it was a separation. But all the details are in the book. The papers are in the book and I highly recommend that you look at this because so often we hear about Maud Gone and John Major being divorced. They were never divorced. They were legally separated. And just another little aside, the Major was a godfather to Sheila Durkin, his niece. And she was the mother of Paul Durkin, the poet, a man you know, who's often been in this premises as well. And many of his books are here. And I have to say, looking back on 2016, when we were doing the centenary celebrations, there was an exhibition in this town on Major John that had his marital status incorrect, that had his birth date incorrect, and that had the date of his death incorrect. <laughs> that wasn't bad now. wasn't bad. <laughs> so, three in a row. Some of us yeah. were annoyed, I have to say. Some of us were annoyed. Because Major John, you know, for Westport people, he is a hero. And I think Westport people have done him proud. You know, with the, the monument down there, the, the sculpture down outside the church and all that. I think he's very much alive. And with all the books from Anthony, he's very much alive, I think, still in Westport. You know, he died a hero. And we should never forget that he paid the ultimate price. And on that note, I, note being the operative word, Charlie Keaton is here. Would you do even one verse of Hurrah for Major John McBride? And we'll honour him again now while we're here. If that's all right. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. how you do it. Yeah. Goodbye. Uh, I got this song a long time ago from a good friend of mine, uh, Arthur McAvoy, from the key, or Dingy McAvoy, as they call him. Dingy McAvoy. And um, he... Give me that song, oh, it's a long time ago, it's good many years ago now. And, uh, of course, he was connected. He, he remembered Major John uh, coming to the Bath Hotel. That's where Arthur was born. And there was a big connection between the McCoys, the McAvoys, and the McBrides. Of course, the McCoys were, were uh, northern people as well, as were the McBrides originally. So I give you a blast of it anyway, to the memory of Arthur anyway, my good old friend. Hurry for Major John McBride For him we give three cheers For Ireland's grand old cause he died With the Dublin Volunteers He fought the English ten to one He tamed their Saxon pride But now our gallant chief is gone Brave Major John McBride With Kruger and the fearless boar He fought for liberty And when he reached the Irish shore He came to set us free For this he laboured day and night For this he fought and died A martyr for our country's right Brave Major John McBride Poor crimeless air and droops her head And mourned with grief and tears Her faithful son in battle dead Brave Irish volunteers When will the red stream cease to flow? When will her tears be dry? And who will raise the flag laid low? For Major John McBride Hooray for Major John McBride, for him we give three cheers, for Ireland's grand old cause he died, with the Dublin Volunteers. Charlie, on to Maud and Major's son, Sean McBride. I always say about this man, he's a distinguished Irish statesman and he's never been properly celebrated, acknowledged or commemorated nationally anyway maybe he's not dead long enough i don't know what it is like he was some he was some man when you think of it reared in paris he was a runner during the anglo-irish treaty negotiations uh, he was chief of staff of the ira then he became a pacifist an international jurist a politician head of the party a minister uh, he was the assistant secretary general of the un one of the founders of amnesty international Winner of the Nobel Peace Prize, the Lenin Peace Prize and the American Medal of Justice. The only person ever to win all three. Ever. And it was he, as we heard, who was responsible for the repatriation of William Butler Yeats back to Drum Cliff. And it's really, really interesting in this. The story of Yeats. 
I don't want to spoil it on people, but I will say that if you're buried in France, you know, there's no such thing as eternity in France. It's all temporary. You're down for a while and you're up again. So that's all I'd say. So, <laughs> and you could get a little move, you know. So it's very interesting. And Anthony has done a great job in getting all the, the paperwork on this. And then, of course, the refusal to repatriate James Joyce. Is there any good Catholics now? It's interesting reading for good Catholics as to why James Joyce was still not in Ireland. There might be a move for that, we never know. Anyway, on to Maud herself. She died in 1953, aged 86. And, you know, she often got bad press, and we know that, with claims and counterclaims, especially dur during the separation case. But, you know, I think history will count her as a most formidable Irish revolutionary. She was one of the great revolutionary women of Ireland. And uh, I know, this is a sad thing, I'll have to say, personally, that a great collection of Maud gone stuff Writings, drawings, paintings, personal effects, common and bond stuff. And the, the original banner from Inion and Ahern, which Maud set up in 1900, and in 1914 then it merged with common and bond. All that stuff is gone to America, to the Burns Library in America. The good thing is that they look after it and they'll make it available. The sad thing is that when it was offered to this country, to the, the powers that be in this country, they weren't interested. That alongside the Molly Gill collection. Molly Gill was working in the Cooler Press and a full run of all the Cooler Press prints also gone to the Burns Library amongst other collections. But as I said, we can bemoan that. But they're safe. They'll be looked after and they're accessible. I want to just give a personal story. I was in England years ago living there happily and uh, I was in the pub game for a long time. And I worked in radio and I moved to Luton to work in BBC in Luton. And I said, I'll take a lease in a pub. So I took a lease in a pub and I called the pub Maud Gons. Mm. Mm. And I had a lot of paraphernalia and pictures blown up and the usual stuff and Major John inside. I was also chair of the Federation of Irish Societies. You know, we had about 100 plus clubs and societies across England and the Channel Islands and Wales affiliated to us. So I was going around the country. But I noticed after I opened the pub, one of the local rags had a headline, uh, something like, you know, um, community leader honours Irish terrorist. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, oh. So I rang the editor and I gave him a choice. Either his solicitors talk to my solicitors or I would write an article that he would not edit and it would be published in full for the following week. You'd know all about that, Claire, you know, in the journalism, you know, all it works. We're all in that boat. We're all in that boat. So he did. But I had to inform the little Englander, as I called him, the little journalist, you know, that Maud Gone, far from being an Irish terrorist, she was the daughter of a British Army colonel. And then, at the same time, when I was working on the radio, uh, there was an Irish artist living in Luton called Peter Dehan from Monaghan. And he was given a commission to paint... John Major, as distinct from Major John. <laughs> John Major was the Prime Minister at the time. So, on my radio hat, I went up to see him, and I went into the, art, into the studio, and all these paintings all over the place. And I said, jeez, I said, you must be a great artist. I said, if you have all these paintings left, why didn't you sell them? He said, if I make something I like, I make a copy for myself. And I looked around, and who was the first person I saw but Sean McBride? The famous paint, picture, picture of him like that. And I said, how did that come about? He says, he came over and asked me to paint a picture of his mother. So I did him. And I said, where's the mother? And sure enough, behind Sean, there was Maud. <clears throat> One of the old photographs, you know, when she was about 83 or 84, you know, the beauty was long gone. It was internalised at that stage. <laughs> and oh, I thought this was just absolutely fantastic. So I invited him down to the pub for the official opening, which was a couple of weeks later, and he arrived in with the painting. And to this day, I have to say, it's one of my most treasured possessions. A lovely picture of Maud Gone by Peter Dean. But anyway, that's enough of this. I just want to say, co gorgeous to this man. Well done. We're grateful for all you have done and all you're still doing, Anthony. And this is a great addition to you know, everyone's collection. And especially for Westport people, because we'll enjoy this. As I say, the McBrides are very much at the heart of all of us in Westbrook. So Cogorgicus, and it gives me great pleasure, as I say, to say on Lowering Shop, a Yolo, it gives me great pleasure to say uh, I want to launch this book. I'm delighted to do so. And thanks to Anthony, thanks to Westport Historical Society, the Rolling Sun, and to Seamus Doherty. Gorimili Mahogany.